Parenting properly through technology storms. That's the topic of today's Bold and Blunt, and I'm your host, Cheryl Chumley, giving you a Christian conservative look at today's news, politics, culture, and events. Parenting children in the age of screens. That is the headline from a July 2020 Pew Research finding that said, and I quote from this piece, Two-thirds of parents in the United States say parenting is harder today than it was 20 years ago, with many citing technologies like social media or smartphones as a reason. And if you're a parent, you know that to be true. Pew Research has been studying the changing times, the changing nature of parenting, family, and how that all relates in this emerging technology, in this technological world that we now live in, for years now. And their findings are fascinating. And if you consider that even two-year-olds, anybody with children, young children nowadays, has seen two-year-olds grab smartphones and figure out how to use them for crying out loud. If you've seen how even young kids walk around with their eyes glued to screens, smartphones and at schools, computers and at homes, laptops and video games and television screens and so forth and so on and so on and so forth, then you have to wonder, not only what is this doing to the physical state of children as they grow and develop, like their eyes, for instance, are, are, are children growing up and becoming blind by the time they're 40 years old, whereas it used to take adults until they're 80 to start to turn blind, but also what it's doing for their, their, their mental health their ability to get along with others, their ability to hold conversations, their ability to interact as humans normally interact all throughout history until technology came into the picture. And what Pew has found, well, I'll tell you that in just a second. If you like Bold and Blunt, I want to let you know that you may get Bold and Blunt at edify.app at Real Life Network. That is the faith-based news outreach of Pastor Jack Hibbs's church in California at WashingtonTimes.com, where you may also subscribe to my Monday, Wednesday, Friday newsletter that contains all my commentaries that I write at the Washington Times. I write on culture and politics and, and globalism and all that good stuff that the left likes to infiltrate and take over. And I give you the bullet points you need to fight this oncoming onslaught of leftist infiltration. And if you want to know how to subscribe to my newsletter, just go to WashingtonTimes.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, Click on the newsletter section and and find Bold and Blunt with Cheryl Chumley. That's me. You'll get my commentaries as well as my Tuesday and Thursday Bold and Blunt podcast where I have all the greatest guests, all the greatest guests that are out there, right? You're going to have to go back through the archives and click on some of my past Bold and Blunts to get a taste of everybody who's come on my show, but I guarantee this, they are the best guests. And one more quick mention you can get Bold and Blunt wherever podcasts are offered. That's right, Spotify, Apple, and all the other places. So let's go back to this Pew Research report, okay? Because it's fascinating. A majority of parents say they have become so concerned about their children spending too much time on screens that they've actually reached out to doctors for advice. 71% profess concern over their child spending too much time on screens. Isn't that interesting? It's interesting for a variety of reasons, but really what, what I find most interesting that is that if you're a parent and your child is spending too much time on screens using technology, that's your concern, then as a parent, why not limit what your child can do with technology. Why not take the phone away? Why not take the TV away? Why not, why not take the laptop, the computer away, except for homework assignments? I, I don't understand the helplessness of some parents in controlling their children's access to screen time because the kids live in their homes. I mean, it, to me, it seems easy enough to control what goes on in your own home. Not always, I suppose. 
not always if you're working two or three jobs and your child is home alone, but in many cases, in most cases, you can still take the laptop away or you can still not buy your kid a phone, right? My kids didn't have phones until they were driving age because to me, they didn't need one until they were driving. As a parent, I thought, you know, if they're driving and they're on a back road somewhere and they get a flat tire or car issues and they can't drive, their car breaks down and nobody's around, well, they need a phone then to call for help. But why does your, why does your nine-year-old need a phone? And just because everybody else has one, to me, doesn't seem a good reason. I don't know. So that, that, that's one easy way to, I guess, address concerns about children spending too much time on screens. But that's just my opinion. Majority of parents say their child 11 or younger watches videos on YouTube. You know, YouTube is just a cesspool, right? There are some good videos out there, instructional videos, historical um, teachings, even even humorous. I watch a lot of um, animal animal videos when I want to unwind. I watch, you know, funny animal videos, maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes at a time or something. But to spend all day on YouTube watching some of the rot that's put out there, wow, protect your child, right? That's just... Um, common sense. A majority of parents today say parenting is harder today than two decades ago, with many citing technology as a reason why. Well, yeah, technology does make things harder, right? Technology in general, social media, social media is just another cesspool. I mean, you know, you say one wrong thing on social media, and there are trolls out there that just, uh, they, they wait they seek this stuff out and then they, they call out their little troll friends to let's get them guys, let's get them, you know what to do. And next thing you know, the, these, these kids in high school, in younger ages, are just being attacked from all corners on social media, called all kinds of vicious names. And you know, this, this in an age where bullying is supposedly one of the top, the top uh, drivers of teenage angst and, and suicide and things like that. Here's, here's an interesting finding. Parents are wary of the impact of mobile devices and relatively few think children under 12 should have their own smartphone. So why are all these little kids walking around with smartphones? I don't know, maybe it's where I live, but I don't see a lot of, uh, children under 12 in my area, my neck of the, the woods, being limited on smartphones, they're all carrying them around. You see them on public transportation. You see them walking down the street. You see them at bus stops. You see, you see them at bus stops, you know, 15, 15 or more kids standing around waiting for the bus, 14 of them staring down in their hands at a smartphone and then the 15th just looking off in the distance because he's the one, he's the one where parents enforce that rule. Few think children under 12 should have their own smartphone. The ages of 12 to 14, Pew writes, seem to be a major milestone in parents' eyes for smartphones. This survey finds that a majority of parents, 73%, believe it is acceptable for children to have their own phone only ha after they have reached at least the age of 12. Some 45% say smartphone ownership is acceptable between the ages of 12 and 14, and 28% say it is acceptable between the ages of 15 and 17. Just 22% think it is okay for a child under the age of 12 to have one. I don't know if I'd, if I'd say just 22%, or if I'd underscore that and make that sort of the lead. 22% of parents in America think it's okay for a child under the age of 12 to have a smartphone. To me, that seems, it seems sort of burying the lead there because 22% seems pretty significant. I mean, geez, that's almost a quarter, quarter of American parents think it's okay for their little kid to have smartphones. I mean, smartphones, you get access to everything, right? And it's impossible. Once you give your kid a smartphone, it's pretty much impossible to uh, monitor everything that they see on technology, on screens, right? 
because you give them a smartphone, they transport it everywhere. They go sleep over a friend's house. And yes, you can try and take the smartphone away or whatever, or going to school, take the smartphone away. But it really, it doesn't take long to look something up on, on a smartphone really quickly. And who knows what comes across in their email? Who knows what their friends are sending them? I don't know. To me, 22% of parents in America think it's okay for a child under 12 to have a smartphone. That's just asking for trouble. There's this other survey that came out in October, October 12th, from Engage, a, uh, a publication of EdChoice. New survey explores parent concerns on social media usage and absenteeism. And they're talking about school and social media. Half of parents say they are extremely or very concerned about the impact of social media on children's mental health. Well, they should be, right? Because at this point in time, we have all these reports and data and surveys and findings coming out how social media really impacts children's self-esteem. It impacts what they think and believe. It influences how they see themselves in the eyes of others, how they see themselves in their own eyes. Instead of, say, taking their identities from Jesus Christ, from God, from the Bible, and from parents, and from family members, their caretakers, they take their esteem from what strangers on social media may or may not say about them or or images on social media that says how they should be looking right adult support policies limiting social media use among minors okay but to me adults are in charge of minors so that seems an easy that seems sort of an easy enforcement provision that adults can just take the phones away from their kids. I don't know why we need laws, right? Because this piece goes on to say, of the provided options, adults are most supportive of requiring children to leave cell phones in secure locations during school hours. And get this, laws requiring parental consent for minors to access social media. Do we need government to step in and do the job of parents do we need government to botch up again, again, freedoms in America by regulating in areas where they really have no business regulating? If you as a parent can't control your child and your child's access, what makes you think the government in Washington, D.C. can? Come on, parents. Exercise your parental rights and your parental authorities. Put your foot down. Quit letting your kids dictate to you how their lives should go, how their lives should progress. That's fine when they're 18 or they're graduated high school or they're emancipated or whatever when they're out on their own. But when kids live under your roof, then take, take your reins of authority. You don't have to be a Nazi about it. You don't have to be a tyrant, but certainly you can control and limit your children's access to certain things that you find based on reports and survey and data as potentially being harmful for their mental health. Pornography use among young adults in the United States. That is a Ballard brief, a survey and finding uh, report conducted at, by BYU. Key takeaways from this report. Pornography exists on 12% of all websites and is viewed by approximately 69% of American men and 40% of American women in any given year. I wonder how many or what percentage of children, of minors, view this pornography. Support and public opinion for pornography have increased among young adults in the last several decades, is another finding from this report. I wonder if that's because they have become accustomed to seeing it, so it's grown more acceptable. One reason for the creation and circulation of pornography is the lucrative nature of the industry. 
In 2023, the adult and pornographic websites industry in the United States was on track to match the revenue of the NCAA at $1.15 billion. Pornography has become a sport, it seems. Another takeaway, using pornography correlates with decreased sex life satisfaction, increased desire for rough or violent sex, and increased chances of divorce. Another takeaway, adult film performers face a range of challenging issues, including mental and emotional well-being, such as depression, eating disorders, suicide, financial struggles, physical and sexual health risks, including STDs and body modifications, such as, I guess, breast enhancements and things like that, strained relationships and the distressing reality of systematic support for sexual abuse and rape. Wow, that doesn't sound good, does it? Pornography is often overlooked largely due to the prevailing pro-porn sentiment among the general public. Those are some interesting takeaways, I guess. Not saying just because you give your little kid a smartphone that this is the life he or she is going to walk into one day, but I am saying that the numbing of pornography, the numbing of violent images uh, opens the door for Americans from younger and younger ages as they have younger and younger ages have more and easier access to the tools to view these images. It opens the door for a numbing, a mass numbing on society. So these images and so forth become acceptable. And then they become part of the culture and then they become demanded. And then soon enough, everywhere you look, from your computer screen to your smartphone to your television screens to your movie theater screens become nothing but decay and rot and it just feeds the the decay and rot even further in society and that's why I'm happy to say that there is some backlash going on right family friendly movies faith-based movies for instance are taking off in this country for the last few years they have been trending they are they they are proving profitable which means they're going to stay around for a while and more and more people will become interested in producing these movies because of course in a capitalistic system profit is a driver but at the same time you need a profit in order to continue to make movies like this so it's a sign of optimism where these movies are taking off people are flocking to see them and they're actually making profits for the producers and my guest today Sam Sorbo, her and her husband, Kevin Sorbo, have been involved in the faith-based filmmaking industry for some time now. They have a new film that's just out. You should go get your tickets. Sorbostudio.com is where you can find out where this film is being played in your area and purchase your tickets. It's called Miracle in East Texas, based on a true story, and Sam Sorbo is here to talk about it. Sam, thank you so much for being on Bold and Blonde. It is so great to have you here. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. It was wonderful to see the premiere of your latest film, you and Kevin's latest film, Miracle in East Texas. What I loved about it is that it's based on a true story. Talk to uh, talk to the, the historical aspects of Miracle in East Texas. Well, in fact, that's, that's a really important element of our filmmaking. We really like to make films about true stories because... We feel like if we put a hero in front of people that is real, people who actually did these things, then the audience can act, can really identify with them. You know, we often will go to the theater, a Marvel theater or a superhero theater, and there's no way that we can fly or <laughs> burn laser beams with our eyes or what have you. And so we're left at the end of the movie not feeling uplifted when this movie is actually intended to to make you feel better about your life, leave you uplifted, and by the way, it is a comedy, so obviously we hope you laugh, and um, the audience seemed to really enjoy it at the premiere, so that was a, that was a uh, blessing, frankly. But, um, but yeah, we like to tell true stories because people can relate to them more 
than not, right? Exactly. And true stories of faith where God's grace is actually part and parcel of the narrative. Those are the best. And that's what's incorporated in Miracle in East Texas. Yeah, I mean, God's always in the story. It's just a question of whether you, the, the filmmaker wants you to see his presence or feel his presence or not. And, of course, there are plenty of filmmakers who prefer to hide the presence of God or deny the presence of God. That's not our stance. We like to show the presence of God so that people can leave the theater, like I said, feeling uplifted and knowing that there is a, a holy God who redeems, right? Forgiveness is a big theme in this movie. It's a theme in my life. We all need forgiveness. And right now we're living in a cancel culture, which is really just a culture of unforgiveness. So I'm hoping that people can take from this movie the sense that forgiveness is still an important aspect of American life. It's a traditional American value. And uh, so we, we try to spread traditional American values back into the culture. It is based on history, but I still don't want to give away the end because I want people to go see this movie. It, it kicks off on the 29th of this month, I believe. But could you speak to the aspect of Winston Churchill talking about uh, the oil fields from this East Texas town being one of the saving graces of the war? Well, that's the most amazing part, and I didn't even know that part of the story. So the film takes place in 1930, starts and ends in 1930. That's Depression-era Texas. And I'm not, I'm not giving a spoiler uh, by saying that they do discover oil. I mean, even that's in the trailer. It's the miracles that happen around this discovery that are so phenomenal. And the what happened was I was sharing it with um, uh, Representative Louis Gomer, and he continued the story for me that I didn't know. And that story, the continuation is that this oil was shipped to the Allied forces overseas in the European front. And so it helped us win the war against the Nazis whose tanks ran out of gas before our tanks did. And that's the incredible thing is that the oil was discovered by these two scoundrels. That's the movie, is the the comedy about these these individuals who discovered oil and and really sh- by all and by all intents really shouldn't have but through god's grace they are the, the ones that discovered the oil. i mean it's just an incredible story but then when you continue the story as as stories do right they continue throughout history um the the placement of this oil in history uh winston churchill said the allies floated to victory on a sea of east texas oil that's the incredible thing yeah, I, I found that so fascinating. I really did. And the, the fact that it's true, it, it just adds a, a huge element to, <laughs> to the story. Uh, I'm on your website, uh, sorbostudios.com, and the production of this film, Miracle in East Texas, occurred in summer of 2018, you have noted, and yet it didn't premiere until this month, 2023. Yeah. What was the holdup there? What happened? Well, I mean, it was supposed to come out in 2019, and COVID hit. And so I yanked it, because no one was going to the theater. I wasn't going to risk opening the film at a time when the government was shutting theaters down. (laughs) So then it just sat on a shelf. I mean, we had all the funding to put it into theaters in early 2019. COVID hit, and that that was just the end of that. Um, And then we scrambled to try to raise money. It's a very difficult market right now. Um, We put together a small budget to promote the movie. That's why what you're doing for me right now and what other people have done in helping us get the word out is is so appreciated. And I hope people will be able to go see the movie, not only that, but share it with their friends, get other families to go see the movie. It's a family-friendly comedy. I don't know the last time that I saw a family-friendly comedy in the theaters. I'm typically... um, and, you know, I'm not easily offended, but honestly, it just seems like comedies have resorted to either sex jokes or poop jokes, and they're just not that funny anymore. This is genuine humor the way that Hollywood used to tell humorous tales. The writer is an Oscar-nominated writer. He's, he's a brilliant writer, and he crafted a beautiful story that has a lot of just organic humor to it. Um, and so I hope that we can get families back enjoying the theatrical experience again. And, and Lou Gossett Jr. narrates, and he, he makes an appearance in the film. And you also have Cliffy from Cheers, John Ratzenberger. <laughs> how, did, how did you get him? Are you friends with him? 
Well, no, not particularly. We, you know, we reached out, and his agent was interested and showed him the script, and he loved the script, and um, it really allowed him to exercise his comedic comedic talents, and he liked the premise of the movie, the fact that it's pro America, pro entrepreneurship. You know, he's very big. Uh, he, he started a movement basically across the U.S. to bring back the trade, because we've. We've traded, so to speak, all of our trades to overseas, and we really need to bring back the trades to the United States of America so that we can repair the things that are manufactured overseas and create them here as well. And so I think that appealed to John. Also, the the element of forgiveness that's a part of the movie, the faith-based part of the, the movie, if you will. And um, he, we just had a blast working with him. He's got such a great sense of humor, and uh, he brought so much to the role. Yeah, you, you can tell his humor just shines through. So I imagine it would have been a fun time uh, filming with him. I I, I want to give people an idea where they can where they can see this movie, how they can buy tickets. Do you have a way to um, sort of speak to all of America? How to get tickets? Yeah, well, it's very simple. Sorbostudios.com has a link for the tickets. It's a Fathom event, which is a very limited event. So it's just Sunday and Monday, the 29th and 30th. And if they go to sorbostudios.com, they click on the link, they put in their um, their zip code, and they'll find the theater or theaters that are closest to them, and then they can order their tickets. Um, so it, it makes it very simple. And what I say to people is, you can order your tickets. I've done this. You screenshot the tickets that you just bought and send it to all your friends, and then your friends can join you at the theater. And uh, it's like easy peasy. It's so easy. They, they, they actually see what seats you've got. <laughs> Um, so it makes it really easy. It's kind of a, the, the newest way to go to the theater. So we're encouraging people to do that. Go and buy your tickets now. Okay, sorbostudio.com. Let's talk in the last couple of minutes about some of the other work that you've been doing because I know that education is your passion. So education, as you know, is my passion. I'm a homeschool advocate. Uh, I think that children are really underserved and, and disserved in school. And actually, it's, there's a funny tie-in because I'm so passionate about this. I created a, a curriculum that is a homeschool curriculum that goes along with the movie because I want parents to understand they have a lot to contribute to the education of their children, even though the schools are marginalizing them and, um, and alienating them from the education of their children. That's a lie, and it should not be allowed. And so I developed a curriculum that goes along with the movie because the movie is a true story. It's about American entrepreneurship. It's about wildcatting. It's about oil. It's about um, the economy. It's 1930s depression era Texas. That's 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 the depression. Like let's let's have a brief discussion of that, and um, and also have, uh, uh, forgiveness. And so the idea is these are discussion questions. I provide some of the answers, the, the ones that are really necessary, and the other ones are just getting your children thinking about deeper subjects. I want parents to understand. Children want to be adults, so give them the opportunity to step up to the plate. Do not uh, downplay or talk childishly to your children, but allow them to try to rise to your level as best they can, and you're going to see you're going to see great advances that you probably wouldn't expect otherwise. In our schools, we tend to infantilize children. That's why we have young people graduating from college who need safe spaces and trigger warnings. And they can't hold a job, much less have a career. This is the, the, the disserving that our education, that our, I don't even call it education system, that our school system is doing to us. And so I just want to encourage people, if you, if you homeschool, this curriculum is perfect for you because you're already doing a lot of this. If you've never homeschooled, try this and see how much you really do have to offer your child or children and let this be a little bit of, a, of an incentive incentive to get started in that direction because um, there's a lot to be gained by educating your children yourself. And, and you and I have, and just to wrap up, I know we only have a couple minutes left, but you and I have had previous discussions about the public school system in general. And just to underscore what we've previously discussed, you do not think the public school systems in America are redeemable at this point, correct? Well, I think the, the big question is, can we fix them, right? And my answer is they're not broken. They are doing exactly what they were designed to do. It is built into the system. 
And when you have a collective system that seeks to educate your child, your child will be educated into the collective. Does that make sense? It makes perfect so sense. That's why we have young people graduating from high school coming from a socialist system of, a, of schooling. And, and Cheryl, between you and me, I don't understand Christians. If you read your Bibles, the Bible never says find a good school for your child. But more importantly, if you understand that the Bible is the greatest book on earth, the greatest book on earth, whether you're religious or not, okay, and you have a, you have a school system that purports to, quote, and it ignores the most important book in human history, the book that actually is the reason that we count the years the way we do, that we mark time the way we do. This is the most important book in human history. And they ignore it, but they're saying that they're educating. That's, that's a misnomer. And as you said, yep, as you said, it's by design. Uh, you know, that's how leftists get their claws into the minds of uh, emerging leaders in America. Well, yeah, exactly. So that's so so and here's the thing. To leave this on a very positive note, the when you take your children out of that system and you start to teach them yourself, you will find the greatest joy. You'll find that it's so much easier than the quote educators have led you to believe because they they want job security. So their their whole mantra is don't try this at home. This is for the professionals. Leave this to the professionals. But honestly, when you when you bring it home and you start interacting on a daily basis with your children, life is so much easier. It's so much better. And they, they become so much smarter. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy that the schools have effectively stolen the family from our culture and robbed us of generational knowledge. And it's so easy to redeem it and, and uh, to, to get it all back. In one generation, we can turn this whole thing around yep. just by home educating. Yep, I, I agree with you. That's why I love talking with you. You tell it like it is. And I, I really appreciate the work you do on behalf of uh, the youth of America. And this Miracle in East Texas movie, it's a must-see, sorbostudios.com. Sam, thank you so much for being on Bold and Blonde. It was great chatting. Thank you so much, and I am bold and blunt. And uh, <laughs> if anybody wants any information about home education, they just go to sorbostudios.com and click on me. Uh, I have a lot of information available to parents to, to help get them out of the, the prison of the school system. It's a prison now, basically. Yep, so, a lot of great... Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming to the premiere. I'm so glad you enjoyed the movie. <laughs> thank you. Miracle in East Texas, that once again is the name of the movie that you should get your tickets to because it's faith-based, it's uplifting, and it's family-friendly, which is something that is difficult to find in today's cultural decaying world. They're Your Kids, that's the name of one of Sam Sorbo's uh, great books that she's written over the years. They're Your Kids, an inspirational journey from self-doubter to homeschool advocate. One other book I want to mention of hers that came out in 2021, Words for Warriors, Fight Back Against Crazy Socialists and the Toxic liberal left check out those books as well if you like bold and blunt you may get bold and blunt at edify.app at real life network at washingtontimes.com and of course wherever podcasts are offered i want to thank you for listening tune in next time and don't forget in the meanwhile stay blunt stay bold